This is the outline of this topic, and then first I'm going to talk about the problem and the difficulties when we formulate uh, the problem into biogenetic biogenetic optimization problem, and then what kind of difficulties we would like to solve. And then uh, later on, I'm going to give you an introduction, and then give you every single details about the biogenetic algorithm. That is how it works, every single step. And then uh, because this is a random based search algorithm. We are going to use a uh, use a lot of random elements into this algorithm. So we have to understand how it works as well as whether this search is consistent or not. For example, when we apply the binary genetic algorithm for the same problem in the first one, we run it in the first time, we are able to find a solution. And then in the next one, whether the performance will be much better or much much worse and then so that is something we would like to investigate otherwise if the learning is unstable or learning that is non it is not consistent and then this genetic algorithm or this search algorithm that is not very much useful yeah and then later on i'm going to give you some details about how it works uh, step by step that is to show you an example by hand and then um, now when we use the performance evaluation, we will we will note um, statistically how good the genetic algorithm works. But the theoretically, how do we show that it works? That is the schema theorem. We will look at the schema theorem just to show that um, why do GA works. And then later on, we are going to cover some applications, some examples. We are going to use the MATLAB and then to um, to see how do we apply to a computer program or computer script to deal with some applications. Okay, so this is today's the aim of this topic, and then so we are going to understand the process of the binary genetic algorithm. That is, we are going to understand every single step, how it works, so that we are able to implement that, and then so we will use it. We will use the binary genetic algorithm to some optimization problem. That means we need to formulate a problem into an optimization problem that the binary genetic algorithm can handle. Yeah, problem solving skill. And then we need to know about the limitations of the binary genetic algorithm compared with others. For example, why don't we use genetic algorithm? Uh, sorry, why don't we use the gradient descent? Why don't we use the line minimization or the simplex method? We have learned that from the previous uh, topics. So once we know the limitation of the BGA, and then uh, we will know whether this application can be handled or not. So the objective, that is, know how it works in details, as well as to, um, to see whether we, we are able to formulate the optimization problem in a, a minimization problem. Yeah, Because as I mentioned in the beginning, I mean um, uh, last week that, in this module, we mainly handle minimization problem because all these learning algorithms, they are designed to deal with minimization problem. But just to recall what I have mentioned that minimization problem can be turned to a maximization problem. So a cost function, if you multiply that by minus one, for example, fx this is the minimization problem with respect to x you can turn it to the maximization problem if you are going to multiply minus 1 to this function yeah so just multiply minus 1 so you can just turn the maximization problem into minimization problem or vice versa yeah now we are going to look at the problem and difficulties so what kind of learning algorithm we would like to have okay so this kind of this kind of learning algorithm which can do minimization of a cost function we have a cost function f of x x it is x1 x2 x3 up to xn a multi variable space and then this f that is a scalar it means that it is in we only when we put in all this value into this function we will obtain one single value for example 1.2 1.23 so and so a real value 
We also expect that this algorithm, this learning algorithm, it does not need to use the gradient information because when we compute the gradient information, it is very time consuming as well as in some cases, this gradient information does not exist. Yeah, and then so we would like to, we would like to have the function evaluation only when we do learning. Yeah. In order to have this kind of learning algorithm, what kind of difficulties we will encounter? Yeah. So I just give you some ideas right here. When we talk about different kinds of cross function, um, non convexity, that is one issue. For example, this is a non convex function. You will just find out that um, this is a non linear function with different local minimum, local maximum, as well as some of them, they would be uh, the global. Yeah. So we have more than one um, optimal point and uh, this kind of function, that is non-convex function. On the contrary, when we talk about the convex function, it means that this function, we only have one local minimum, that is the global minimum as well. So this kind of function that is easily be handled by the gradient descent. For example, when we choose this point and according to the update rule, we will just simply jump to the local minimum, yeah. If the learning weight is right, yeah. Okay, this function can be handled by, by gradient descent. Of course, it can be handled by the binary genetic algorithm as well, yeah. But for this kind of function, and then so the gradient descent can also work, but it will just give you the local minimum. For the binary genetic algorithm, it tends to find the global minimum, yeah. And then the next one that is the multimodality. It means that we will have a very complex function. This complex function, for example, it has sinusoidal wave or the cosine wave, so that we have a many local minimum as well as the um, it goes up and down. So just like these two functions, yeah. So for this kind of function, and then um, if we are going to use the gradient descent. It is very easy to be trapped in the local minimum, yeah. But when we use this binary genetic algorithm, it tends to find the global minimum, and then another one that would be the non smoothness. That means when we have a function something like that, this is a continuous function. But at this point, d f d x does not exist. That means gradient descent approach cannot be used. So another one. That would be the discontinuity. When we have a line, something like that, at this point, it jumps. We do not have any value in between. It jumps to four and then it continues. In that case, this discontinuous function, again, we do not have d, f, d, x. And then so if this kind of function has a lot of jump, and then it will become very complicated. In this case, the binary genetic algorithm can handle this case as well. The last one, dimensionality. That means when we are talking about a large number of decision variables, say x1 to x10,000, we have 10,000 decision variables. If we are going to use the gradient descent, we need to, we need to find, um, it is very time consuming as well as computational expensive to find the gradient information yeah but it can be it can be easily done comparatively using the function evaluation that is what the genetic algorithm is going to do yeah so biogenetic algorithm can deal with all these functions yeah with these characteristics yeah so we are going to have a very brief introduction about the binary genetic algorithm. When we talk about genetic algorithm, that is a kind of technique to solve, solve problem which lead optimization. This is a very um, broad meaning um, or the broad usage of the genetic algorithm and then so it really depends on how you formulate the problem. That means if you are able to formulate the problem into an optimization problem, the genetic algorithm can be applied. For example, the classification problem, we can turn it into an optimization problem. We will have an example about the classification problem later on so that uh, you can appreciate how we can use this kind of learning algorithm to design a classifier. Yeah? 
and GA, that is a subcast of evolutionary computing. When we talk about evolutionary computation, it consists of, of a number of topics. Genetic algorithm, that is one of them. When we talk about GA, we can break it down into BGA, that is the topic I'm talking about, the binary genetic algorithm, or as well as the CGA, that is the continuous genetic algorithm. We will cover that in the next topic. In topic five, we will cover the genetic programming as well. The genetic programming, we use the tree coding and then in the genetic algorithm, BGA, we use the binary coding, yeah? And in topic six, we talk about the evolution strategy and we will also have the evol evolutionary programming, but we will not cover that in uh, this module, yeah? When we talk about evolutionary computation, and then we would like to know what it is, because actually the main focus, that is, we would like to use the lateral evolution mechanism. So this kind of evolution mechanism, that is, uh, for example, the DNA, yeah, we use the DNA concept, that is a kind of evolution mechanism, that is, generation by generation, we pass the information from one generation to another and then evolve so that we are able to improve the performance or the quality of the offspring, yeah? So that is, that is mentioned right here to modify a population of individual, yeah? So that means generation by generation, this population, the characteristic will change in a good way so that each generation will improve the quality, yeah? So subject to the concept of the survival of the fitness, that means some good characteristic of the parent or the offspring will survive. The bad ones will die down, yeah? Okay, we will cover this uh, later on. So history of the genetic algorithm. EC evolved in 1960. In 1970s, uh, Professor John Holland, uh, based on EC, proposed genetic algorithm. That is the topic for today. Yeah. Okay. Now when we talk about the biogenetic algorithm, we also share Darwin's theory of evolution. You will find out that uh, we based on this concept. Yeah. For example, when we talk about a population of individuals, say we have a number of individuals. So some some of the, their faces may look like this. A circle uh, and then to a square and then to maybe a triangle um, diamond something like this say in this generation they are going to reproduce themselves that is they are going to get married and generate the next generation so maybe this one will give you a square hat and share the eyes from the circle face and then this one may be um, a circle face and share the eyes from um, the square face and so and so so these two pair this pair will generate different kind of faces as their child as their children so this is the next generation so that the Darwin's theorem just mentioned that the offspring has many of the characteristics from its parent. So that, for example, these kind of eyes passed on to um, the next generation and then so. So if this characteristic does not change much in the next generation, that means these are good characteristic and then so these characteristics are stable, yeah, because they can stay. And then so there are variations in characteristic between individuals. When you look at different kind of offspring, they look different, and then so they have some variation in different shape, in different form, and then through the mutations. Sometimes their eye, they're longer, smaller, something like that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if we are going to repeat this process, they are going to get married and then generate a lot of different kind of offspring, and then so. So you will just find out that only a small percentage of the sp of the offspring will survive to adulthood. We can understand like this. That means this kind of face, and then so 
whether they it will survive to the next generation, next generation, next generation, and then that is the issue we talk about. So only the good characteristic will survive to the next generation. So this is only a small amount of these characteristic will survive to the next generation. It is mainly because not every characteristic is good enough in that environment. That environment that is governed by the cost function. Yeah. So good offspring will survive because they inherit a good characteristic from the parents. And then so these are the main points of the Darwin's theorem of evolution. And then later on, we will just find out that genetic algorithm use exactly the same ideas. Okay. By genetic algorithm, and then so we just compare the biological metaphor the lateral selection that is about the DNA. Using the DNA, we talk about the genetics and evolution concept. In DNA, we use different terminologies such as gene, chromosome, crossover, mutation, phenotype, genotype, alike, some, uh, something, something like that. Yeah. And then we are going to use the same terminologies to describe something very similar. But in the biogenetic algorithm, we are going to use this term to develop different kind of components. Say, we are going to use the encoding, decoding to represent the gene as well as the chromosome. We are going to use the fitness function to tell what kind of enrollment these individual will be in and also the population. That is, we can have a number of DNA population and then to the selection process. How do they call, do crossover, mutation, so and so. so we will just find out that we just BGA share the idea of the lateral selection. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now I'm going to summarize what kind of advantages the biogenetic algorithm will have. Yeah. So this is something aligned with what I mentioned in the beginning that uh, the problem as well as the difficulties. Yeah. Because when we use the biogenetic algorithm, we can deal with both continuous and discrete variables. Yeah, so that means when we have a function x1, x2, up to xn, this function, this f, uh, sorry, this x, no matter they are continuous or discrete, we can handle that. But when we use the gradient design approach, we, we do not allow discrete variable. Yeah, and then also this function whether it is continuous or not, whether they, it has derivative or not, we can still handle that using the BGA. Yeah? The number of decision variables, comparatively, we can handle a large number of decision variables. That means when n becomes very large, we can still handle that because we do not need to use the gradient information, the search that is based on the function evaluation. Plug in this value into this cost to justify whether this is a good solution or not. So that because of this reason, and then so we can handle something very complex, the cost function that is very complex because the same reason we do not need to do the derivative. Yeah. So, so this is the reason and so uh, the BGA because there are a lot of random element right here and then so, so that we have a mechanism to skip out the local minimum. So the BGA tends to search for global minimum. Yeah. Okay. This slide is a list of the notations we use. I'm not going to go through that one by one. So um in due course, when we encounter these variables, I'm going to explain that to you one by one later on.